Welcome to the next episode of General Relativity. I'm your host, Rifat Bari, graduate student at Brown University. And today we're going to be discussing covector fields. Now, what's so important about covector fields? Well, today I'm going to show you how differentials, your good old dx, dy, dr, d theta, are the exact same things as what we've been talking about the last few lectures, which are covector fields. In other words, what I'm going to show you today is that if you have a good old function, a good old integral, like the integral of f of x dx, then this dx in this integral is the exact same thing as the covector field associated with that dx that has a certain direction of ascending ascent and some vector v. So, in other words, this differential right here, the differential dx, is equivalent to its two sides of the same coin as this covector field. Okay? And how is that true? How can that possibly be correct? One is a small infinitesimal change in the variable x, and the other one is some kind of a weird bunch of contour lines. Well, the old definition, the old definition of d, the differential dx, was as follows. If you have a variable x, x is just a variable, right? Then applying the d operator to x gives you a small change in that variable, dx. So dx is a small change in the variable x, in the variable x. But now what we're proposing is that d does something completely different. It takes a scalar function. For example, this is our new interpretation of what this operator d does. If you have a scalar function f of x, y, then d converts that scalar function into the contour lines of that scalar function. It converts it into a covector field with a certain direction of ascension and an origin with some vector. So this is the new definition, the new purpose of this operator d. It takes a scalar function f, a scalar function f of x comma y, and it converts it into a covector field, a covector field. So now let's take a look at some examples of covector fields in action. So now let's take a look at a few examples of covector fields in action with the differential application that we just talked about. So let me show you what I mean. Let's say we have a scalar field that looks as follows. I'm going to use different colors to indicate different values on my scalar field. The color blue will represent very negative values. An example of such a field, such a covector field, such a scalar field, might look something like this. If I have my x, y, and z axes here, then first near this direction, I might have very negative values. So maybe I can just draw a plane. Let me just draw a plane over here. And this plane, as you can see, it has very negative values right over here to the left. Near the origin, it has values close to zero. And beyond the origin to the right, it has a lot of positive values. So that is the kind of function we're dealing with here. Now, of course, this function is more complicated because the control lines look like curves rather than just straight lines, but that's the general idea. Now, let's say I apply my d operator to this scalar field. Let's call this scalar field f, where f is a function of x, y. And if I apply this d operator here, it's going to give me a new field. But this is not going to be a scalar field anymore. No, it's going to be a covector field. And that covector field is going to be formed out of the contour lines, the level sets of this function f. So what does this indicate? Well, first of all, the contour lines are going in this direction. This is the direction of increasing function value because the function is increasing in this direction. And for example, this contour set might represent negative 1 for the value of f. This contour line might represent the value of 0 for f. And this contour line might represent the value of 1 for the function f. And so that's the general idea for the function of this operator d. 
Now let's take a look at another example of using the operator D to convert a scalar function F into a covector field D. So let's say we have a function as follows. Let's say we have a scalar function that has negative and positive regions like this. So what would that function look like in three dimensions? Well, I can't really draw well in 3D, but maybe we would have a function as follows. A function that would have deep pits. So if I apply my operator D to this scalar function F, then I will obtain the level sets, the contour fields, the covector fields for this scalar function. And what will that look like? Well, this will look like a region that's divided into four sections for each of my four max and mins. And we're going to have some contour lines here. Now, of course, our function arrows always point to the direction of increasing ascent. So if we want to get out of the minimum, if we want to exit the minimum, then we walk in this direction, trying to exit our minimum field. So we are trying to exit the minimum by walking away from that value. And what about our maximums? Our maximums also look similar. These are the contour lines for the maxima of the function. And for the maxima, we're trying to get to the maxima because that is the direction where the function increases. So these are the vectors of increasing ascent. Okay, so that's the general idea for how we convert a scalar function f into a vector covector field df using this differential operator. So to summarize, what we've just shown is that this operator df, it takes a scalar function f and converts it into a covector field df. Another way that we can phrase this is that it takes a function, a function f, and it converts that function into the level sets of that function, the control lines of that function. And finally, the last way, operator differential operator D converts a zero form, this is known as a zero form field, into a one form. Okay? And so that's the general idea. That's what we're really doing here. So let me further explain what we mean by the differential operator D converting a scalar function F into a covector field DF. What we mean is this. In the x, y axis, we have two basis vectors, i hat and j hat. Now, if we consider just the i hat basis vector, this basis vector, as a scalar field, then what would it look like? Well, it would look something like this. The x-axis has negative values to the left, so it would be shaded blue over here, where it's negative, and it has positive values as we move to the right, so it would be shaded pink over here. And in the middle, where it's close to zero, it would look kind of yellow. So this is the scalar field for just the x-axis. And if we apply the differential operator D to the scalar field, we get the following covector field. We get contour lines that are vertical as follows, are increasing in this direction to the right. And for example, this contour line might represent x is minus one. This contour line might represent x is zero. And this one might represent x is plus one, positive one. So that's the general idea of how the differential operator D converts the scalar, front, the scalar field associated with just the x basis vector into this contour, into this covector field. We can do the exact same thing with y. So this is E sub x hat. In the y direction, we also have contour lines. This time, y is negative as I'm going down. So this is the negative direction. And as I go up, the y values become progressively more positive. And in the middle, the y values are close to zero. And so if I apply my differential operator D to this scalar field associated with the y basis vector, then once again, I obtain these covector fields lines. But now they're horizontal, as you can see, and they increase in the vertical direction. 
And this field line, for example, might represent y equals negative 1. This field line might represent y is 0. And this field line might represent y is positive 1. So that is the general idea behind applying the differential operator D to a scalar field and obtaining a covector field in return. Now we can repeat the same idea in polar coordinates. In polar coordinates, we have just two basis vectors. The first is r, whoops. The first is r, which is radially outwards. Okay, so if this is my circle of constant radius, then the r basis vector goes in this direction. And the theta basis vector goes in the angular direction as follows. So if I draw the scalar fields associated with each of these basis vectors, what would they look like? Well, let's draw first the scalar field associated with the r basis vector. For the r basis vector, the scalar field looks like this. As we move increasingly outwards, the r value gets larger and larger. Okay, so what I'm going to draw it as is first the r values are small. So let's, let me just use a light shade of blue. And then the r values get bigger. So I'm going to use a more concentrated version of blue. And as I get even further out, the r values get even larger, right? There's no limit to how big your radius can get for the scalar field. And now if I apply, this is my scalar field f associated with the r hat basis vector. If I apply the differential operator d to this scalar field, then I'll obtain the covector field associated with this basis vector scalar field. And what is that? What does that covector field look like? It looks like exactly what you might expect. The contour lines of this scalar field are just circles of constant radii. And the circles increase in this direction, in this radially outwards direction. And so that's the general idea. This circle, for example, might represent a radius r equals 1. The second circle might represent a radius r equals 2 and so on and so forth. So that's how we've converted our scalar field f for the radial basis vector into a differential covector field df, or as more appropriate for this case, r has been converted into dr. Now likewise, let's repeat the same analysis with the theta hat variable. For the theta hat variable, we have theta increasing in this direction. So theta will start out small, over here, but as we progressively go outwards, theta will get larger and larger. So I'm going to start shading in. I'm going to make the size of the theta vectors, the theta things, bigger and bigger. So as you can see, as I go outwards, as I go in the theta hat direction, the value of theta increases more and more. So this is the scalar field associated with theta. And if I apply my differential vector, my differential operator D, then I obtain the covector field associated with theta, which looks kind of like a fan spreading outwards as follows. And the direction of increasing ascent for theta is in the radial direction as follows. So this is d theta. That's how d theta looks like. So this is the new interpretation of differentials like dx, dy, dr, d theta. So this is what dr really looks like, right? It just looks like a contour lines of circles. And this is what d theta looks like. It's just a bunch of lines that are going in a radial direction. dx looks like a bunch of vertical lines that are increasing as I move to the right, this is dx. And dy looks like a bunch of horizontal lines that increase as I go up. So this is the new world. This is how differentials look like from now on. Now differentials are no longer tiny infinitesimal changes in a variable. Instead, their entire vector fields, their covector fields, such as covector fields made out of contour circular lines, covector fields made out of radial lines, covector fields made out of vertical and horizontal lines. So that is the moral of today's story. Thank you for watching this episode of General Relativity. I hope you've learned something new. 
and we'll see you in the next one.